So let's start out go here. This is an introduction just to business statistics in general. Uh, we'll run through some very basics of data and then kind of how we work a little bit with it. So, you know, just to kind of start out, you know, where am I getting a lot of this data? You know, I put some different sources up here. Um, I'll try to embed a lot of the sources that, I, you know, I'm grabbing data from along the way. If I ever forget or don't, there's something and you're interested in it, feel free to reach out and then kind of let you know. Um, but we'll be looking at like labor statistics. We can use finance data. The Fed Reserve puts out a lot of economic data on different states, countries. Um, oh. And then the NL uh, SY or National Longitudinal Survey of the Youth, just a lot of information on individuals. It's like this massive uh, survey that was done. Um, so we'll use a lot of different types of data. So just kind of just start out kind of a dumb example. Um, but I've got some old Cubs data. Uh, and the salary that they were, they're paying different players. This is by no means comprehensive. This is just like a snapshot of, of every player. But, you know, even though this is a baseball team, you can kind of imagine, like, it's hard to get data from companies, but they would have very similar what we call variables, right? So each kind of row of our data set here, very small data set, is what we call an observation or an element. You might see that, that phrase used in the book. Um, I'll tend to kind of go with the terminology of observations. Um, so those are kind of our rows, right? We've got a bunch of different players. Those are our observations. Every column represents a variable, right? So here we've collected information on different players, their names, their position on the team, and their salary. This could be any company, right? Here's your employees. Here's, you know, assistant manager, assistant to the regional manager. Um, and then here we've got kind of our, our salaries as well, right? So elements, our observations, and then variables are kind of our columns. Right? So what are some types of data that we're going to be looking at? So we're going to kind of categorize these into really ma two main categories and then break those down a little bit. So the first we have is going to be qualitative. So this is categorical data. These are names or labels that just identify some characteristic of the observations. If we go back, you know, what's a good qualitative variable here? Well, just your position on the team. Right? It's not numerical. It's just a here an abbreviation, but you know you could be a title of what the position the person has. Excuse me. Um, another example: if I had like a used car data set and I had what the color of the car was, you know, the color doesn't really tell me anything intrinsic about the the car. It's just it's just the characteristics of the car. Right? And so, and kind of think about qualitative as words. That might be a not so technical way to remember. Quantitative, we're thinking about we've got numerical data. We actually have some numbers we can work with. We can do a lot more with quantitative data. And we'll talk about ways we can kind of uh, make qualitative data a little bit more, um, how, how we can make it so that we can work more with it and come up with more statistics from it. But for now, kind of think about most of the data we're going to be looking at in this class is going to be numerical. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if we think about my used car data set example, this would be like the mileage of the car. Right, it's an, I can put an actual numerical value to it. Okay. Within these categories, we can break it down into two other categories. So for, for qualitative data, the very kind of first category we'll look at is what we call a nominal variable, right? So these are just categories that have no intrinsic value. So this is like the color of the car. I can't rank order the, the cars under just their color. Now, maybe for an individual and their preference I could, but in kind of general, it doesn't tell me anything about how I could rank these cars. So no real intrinsic value, hair color, maybe I've had a data set on an individual's hair color, you know, gender, baseball positions in my, my previous uh, example, you know, all of these, I, I can't rank them. They're, they're just some characteristic of the observation. So we go back, right? I've got that position. Um, sorry, that position variable. Ordinal variables, um, while still qualitative, are a little bit more useful, right? So with an ordinal variable, still qualitative, still categorical. However, the the categories have some intrinsic value or less technical way you think about, you can rank the data based off of this. Mm -hmm. So nice example of this, at the end of the semester, you always do these kind of uh, teacher value or teacher evaluation, professor evaluations, um, and they ask you different questions and you say, do I agree, strongly agree, neutral, disagree, right? You give kind of this, this response, right? Um, now, here, they're still just words, they're not numerical, so it's qualitative data. But I know that if 
someone responded that they strongly agree that this person was an effective teacher, well, that is more than someone who just agrees. And that's more than someone who strongly disagrees, right? I can order, right, ordinal, I can order the data based off of this qualitative variable, okay? Um, another thing, we'll kind of look at some examples throughout the semester, education level. So a lot of the times, like, we don't put this in terms of the number of years, so it's not numerical. It's just, do you have a high school degree, less than a high school degree, college education, a graduate degree, right? They're just, it's a word, it's a qualitative variable, but we can rank or we can order the data based off of it, okay? So another example of this, let's say I had a small data set and I had letter grades. I don't have the actual, you know, percent or the numerical value for the grade that the person got in the class, but I can observe what grade they were given, right? A, B, C, A minus. So here, once again, qualitative, just a word, right? Not here, since it's a letter, right? It's non-numerical, but I can rank these, right? I know people who got A's, they're better than people who got A minuses, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So pretty easy so far, I think examples. Um, we'll then kind of switch over and think about quantitative variables, right? So we can break quantitative variables down into two main categories. Okay? The first is going to be um, discrete variables, right? So these are quantitative, right? They're numerical values, but there's jumps, right? Or I can only see certain values, okay? So what are some examples of this? Well, if I ask you the number of siblings you have, you know, one, two, three, four, you, hopefully you don't have, you know, half a sibling, like one and a half, two and a half, I guess if you're thinking about not sharing the same parents, but right, you actually, they're either a sibling or not, right? So we have these, what we say like integer values, right? We can't see 1.25, we can't see 3.95. There's jumps in the numerical values we can record. Another thing, we'll look at some survey data. It's like the number of days you do something. So here I've got the number of days you consume alcohol each, each week. Well, as soon as you have a drink to, in, today, <laughs> hopefully not, <laughs> um, but as soon as you have a drink, you've consumed alcohol in one day, right? That week. And then, you, you know, can't have 1.5 or 3.29, right? It's either drank one day, two of the days, three of the days, et cetera. So... These are examples of discrete variables. You know, if you think about like this on a number line to kind of give us a visual, it looks like my, my footer's getting in the way a little bit here on the slides. Um, but, you know, I could see the value of one. I could see the value of five. I can't see 7.3. Right? So we're only kind of seeing these, you, you know, most examples are going to be integer values. Okay. Continuous variables are still quantitative. They're numerical data. Um, but they can be any number. All right, so this is really like uh, kind of thinking about with continuous variable. There's really an, an infinite number of numbers we could see. So height. I, if I could measure height precisely, I could measure it out to not even the second decimal. I could measure it out to whatever decimal I wanted. So I could see seventy-one point four five. I could see sixty-eight point three two one five nine seven eight. Right? So that would be a truly continuous variable. Now, generally, um, we look at things to the second decimal and you know if we're recording height even it's probably hard unless i have a really precise measurement tool to record it out anything past a second decimal but anytime when you have decimals associated with the numerical values you're seeing we, we kind of assume or we treat that as continuous variables right? the actual practicality of it you know might limit us to two decimals or three and you know depending on our recording uh device right or, or our I'm using a ruler versus like lasers or something like that. Um, but anything that we see with a decimal, we think of as a kind of continuous variable. Weight, same kind of idea. Annual salary, right? I can see any value in between 54,000 and 53,000, right? Out to the second decimal. In fact, you know, really sometimes when you look at salary, it could be even paid, you know, it, we always round to the second decimal, but we think of that as like a continuous variable. So, you know, just a, another visual, I can see two, I can see five, I can see 6.3, right? So, you know, we'll go back to that Cubs data again, um, but that salary variable, yes, I, I only had it measured out to kind of the integer values here. So if we want to be real technical, yeah, I wasn't seeing values in between, you know, 12,500 and 12,501, or five, sorry, 12,500,000, 12,500,001. Um, but we kind of treat this, you know, seeing, you know, we know in reality, salary can be measured out to the second decimal. We think of this as a continuous variable. But if we're going to be, like I said, you're going to be a real stickler, technically, this could be even thought of as discrete if I couldn't see anything in between the different dollar values. All right. So 
What are some different types of data sets? So here I say types of data. This is probably a little bit more accurate. Would have been say types of data sets now. Okay. So I'm thinking about cross-sectional. Um, this is going to be something where I've got you know a bunch of different characteristics recorded for my different observations or my different subjects, but it's all at the same point in time. So this would be like if I collected information on the unemployment rate of every single state for the year 2023. That would be cross-sectional data. Many different subjects or observations, right? It's all collected at one point in time. Time series data would be like if I had collected for the state of Indiana, one subject, some variable at multiple points in time. So this would be like I collected information on Indiana for the last 20 years, what their unemployment rate was in each of those years. Panel data is like mashing the two together. I'm going to have many, many different subjects and many, many different time periods. So this would be like if I had all 50 states, right? And I had unemployment rates collected for them for the past 20 years for each state, right? Multiple points in time, multiple subjects. That would be panel data. So we'll look at all, you know, use these different types. Um, we won't dive too much into kind of the, the, the differences in uh, how this impacts what we eventually will get to in this class, which is uh, regression analysis. But we will kind of see examples of these different types of data sets along the way. So just to kind of give you some data sets, you can kind of visualize this, what this would look like. I use some examples and then just to describe some, but here, if I had um, GDP, education expenditures for a bunch of different subjects, a bunch of different countries, but it's all at one point in time, the year 2011, right? Why I was 2000, I just had this data laying around. <laughs> um, so this is cross-sectional. All right, another example of cross-sectional data, you know, we might think about here, oops, I've got kind of different population measures for many, many different subjects, but I've recorded this all at one point in time. Now, technically, we can almost think about here because I've got multiple different years. It kind of looks like panel data, but we'll see in a little bit, panel data has to be set up a little bit differently where each time period can't be a separate variable. So if we have different time periods collected as different variables, we would still think of this as cross-sectional. Time series data, right? That was where we had one subject, United States. I have their unemployment rate for the past however many years. Okay. And then panel data, the way we have that set up, well, here I've got one student, like their student ID is one, here's another student, their ID is two. You know, we could put names to this if we wanted to. I just had you know, a student ID that I assigned to them. I've got multiple points in time for each subject, right? 2009, 2011, 2000, or sorry, 2010, 2011. So I, you can kind of see panel data here. It's set up so that every row is a different time period. It's not how we had it set up over here. So panel data, we're going to have set up that every observation represents an individual and a time period combination. So individual one in 2009, individual one in 2010, et cetera, et cetera. And this is like I-step score data. It's an old I-step score. I think a lot of you probably took this test. Um, so what's some other traits about data we're going to have to talk about, or it's going to kind of run into these um, to this terminology throughout the semester, would be the difference between population data and sample data. So population data is going to be, we've got a set of subjects in our data set, and it's every single subject in whatever we're trying to draw conclusions about. So if I'm interested in, say, oh, if I'm interested in every single, you know, what the average GPA is of an IU student, I would need in my population data to have every single current IU student in order to calculate that average GPA. So population is when we have, have when data was when I have everybody um, in the group that I'm interested in drawing conclusions about. You know, how can I get this? Usually this is through a census. Sometimes, you know, like IU, they collect data on an individual student's grade, so they might be able to have population data there. But it's usually hard to get. You can kind of think about it. Well, what if I was interested in the average height of people in the U.S.? Technically, if I had population data, I would need the height of every single person in the United States. It's kind of hard to get the information. A lot of the times, how do we do that? Through things like a census. So they're cost, you know, pretty costly. We only do them every 10 years. Um, but that is generally how we would, you know, an easy way to get some population data. Usually we're just gonna we're gonna have a sample data set. 
All right, so usually we're just going to have a small subset of the population. So if I was interested in the average GPA value student, you know, but I only had, um, I don't know, random 500 different students, it's going to be much smaller than the total population. Or if I'm interested in the average height in the U.S., probably not going to have the height of every single person, but maybe I, you know, through medical records, collect that a couple million. So sample data set of 5 million is still sample data. We don't have the entire population. So sample data sets can be large, but if the population is large, you know, we're still only going to have a subset of it. So our sample data will, set will always be less than what our population data set would look like. So why do we need to sample? I kind of already mentioned this a little bit. Um, usually what we're going to do in this class, and we'll kind of go through the methods, we're going to have sample data. We're going to use it to make inferences about the population as a whole, right? It's hard to get population data because it's really expensive, right? So if you think about, you know, you go around and collecting data and tr trying to record the unemployment rate of different counties, and it's, it's, you know, you're going to have a lot of different agents you have to send out there to every single company. It's going to be very, very expensive to do that. Right. Also, it's just not practical, right? So, so if I, here, here's a good one. Um, let's say I was interested in the obesity rate in the United States. So I, I start, I get all these agents and I send them out and they go to every household and they record the height, the weight, and they calculate the BMI, you know, and come up with whether or not the person was obese. And they do that for every single household. So that's very expensive. But also, by the time I collect all that data, what's probably happened? It's probably not accurate anymore. Some of those people have now probably lost weight or gained weight. And so sometimes it's just not practical, right? It takes way too much time to collect all this data so that by the time it's collected, it's no longer really accurate or useful. Um, it's much easier to go out and collect 200 people's weights and then make look at that average weight and make some inference about the population of the United States as a whole. Okay. So that's kind of why we say it. So other terms that I'll kind of use as, as we kind of jump into that next chapter. So technically this video is kind of like chapter one, just an introduction to data, uh, business statistics. The next thing we'll be looking at is chapter two, which is you know tables, um, looking at descriptive statistics, displaying data. So descriptive statistics are just gonna be different, um, different values we come up with that describe different traits of the population or the sample data set that we have. Statistical inference is something that we'll be using a lot this semester, which is this idea that I'll look at my sample data, I'll look at its descriptive statistics, and then use that to make general generalizations about the population as a whole, because I often don't have that population data. So making inferences from our sample is the best we can often do. So just to kind of set us up for the class, just to make, I don't know, think about some interesting things. You know, I think one of the takeaways I want you to, to have from this class is being able to think about different statistics you see reported in media outlets or you know, government agencies, and maybe think a little bit harder about what they really mean and uh, how people often lie with these statistics. So first example, you know, California has more teachers in Arizona. Therefore, you know, this maybe it's a media outlet, some newspaper they put out, oh, so California cares more about their children's education, right? They've got more teachers, right? More teachers per, or, or just more teachers. But why? Does this you know, conclusion really not make any sense? Well, we're not maybe interested in the number of teachers, but the number of teachers per student, right? There's a lot more kids in California than there are in Arizona. I would hope California has more teachers. Right? So you kind of think about you know, sometimes the conclusions that are drawn from a very real statistic, California does in fact have more public teachers than Arizona, but our conclusion, like that statistic isn't, our, our conclusion isn't, supported by that statistic example two so if you look at um you know, sports uh big thing is you know small versus large market teams so cities that have much higher populations and have a lot more money um then you know so we think about like indianapolis is like a smaller market team so if we think about the world series if i said okay six of the last 10 world series a small market team won so oh, Conclusion I'm coming up with, oh, money doesn't buy championships. It doesn't matter that you have a large market, you have all this, money, you know, a lot more money to buy better players because six of the last 10 World Series were won by small market teams. Well, why did they choose just the last 10? If you went back to the 11th and it was a small market team, well, seven out of 11 is actually better than six out of 10. So what was probably true if they went back to the 11th year, it was a large market team, six out of 11 isn't as good as six out of 10. 
And maybe if they go back a couple of years, maybe it's only six out of the last 15, right? So think about why people censor the data at what they do. So if they only go back 20 years, why? If they only look at the last, you know, three years of data, why? Why did they stop at that at that level? Or why did they censor the data at a certain point? Because, you know, you could go back and see if it was a small or large market team, you know, 12 years ago, or were they just lazy or, or did they choose that censor point for a reason? Example number three. So this is one of my favorite examples and I burned it kind of class one or video one here, I guess. But a study found that 90% of bar fight deaths were an individual who started a fight. And so karma is a fill in the blank, right? Well, how is the data being reported here? If I think about bar fights that end in a death, who's the only person left? The person who killed someone, are they going to admit to starting that fight? Probably not. They're going to want to claim self-defense for very obvious reasons. So we got to think about how is the data being collected, right? Why, where did we get the, who did we get the data from and why might it be have some bias? Right? Um, the last one, which we'll really dive more into towards the end of the class, but we'll kind of preview it now. So higher ice cream sales are highly correlated with drowning deaths. Ice cream, so the conclusion, ice cream is, is causing people to die, right? Well, that on its face we know is, seems ridiculous, but why is there, there is a very strong positive correlation between these two things. That's a very real statistic, but what are we not factoring in? They're both being caused by something else, right? They're only correlated with each other because they're both correlated with, say, in this example, warmer temperatures, right? Uh, another example I'll show you later on in the semester. It's kind of interesting. You know, if you look at uh, organic food sales and autism rates, they're strong positive correlation, right? I don't think organic food is causing autism rates to rise. It's likely that, you know, maybe we're able to diagnose autism more um, accurately, or we have an, an increased focus on, on our, our children's health. And that increased focus on children's health also results in people buying their kids better food when we're organic food, right? So, um, you know, just because we have, oh, sorry, <laughs> just because we have correlation doesn't mean that we always have uh, causation. Right? And that's something that we'll dive into once we get to regression, which is the last chapter we'll cover in this class. So this has been the introduction to business statistics. Um, next video will be uh, kind of tables displaying data uh, and analyzing it that way.